So many of you, I'm sure, are very aware that Britain has always been a major class-based society. Even more so than, let's say, the United States of today, Britain is tremendously stratified in classes. And everything about who you are in Britain, whether you are English, Scottish, Irish, or Welsh, is based on what class you are in. And the jobs you have, more so than anything else, identify who you are within that class system. And your class can be discovered, uh, things tell you, not just how you dress, but how you speak, where you live, uh, obviously as the type of job you hold. All of these things identify which class to which class you belong. The most powerful of those classes are the, is the one at the top, right? We all know that Britain is and remains to this day a a monarchy, right? Queen Elizabeth II is is the current queen and has been for 60 some odd years. But going back into history into our period of the Victorian era, aristocracy had been losing power throughout Europe. Um, but the British had remained there, remained uh, strong in theirs, right? And that, that's for a couple of reasons, right? I mean, the French had had their revolution that had done leaps and bounds towards eradicating the, um, the nobility. And in Britain, that did not exist, right? There had not been, let's say, a revolution, and in fact, there still has not been one. Uh, the same would be true if we looked at places like Germany in the, in the mid 19th century. Again, that never happens in Britain. So Britain's aristocracy remains and, and, and indeed still remains. People are still becoming or being made dukes and barons and vassals and lords and all these things that are indicative of, of an aristocracy. So who are these people, particularly in the Victorian era? In the Victorian era, this would be your landed class. They would own large estates and on those estates, there would be tenants who pay them either monthly or annual rents. They held a lot of political power in the 19th century, in the 1800s. Why did they hold so much political power? Well, first, they had a lot of money. Uh, their landed estates, which were rented out and produced a lot of goods, whether that be grain, uh, cotton, or, or wool, whether that was corn in some places, whether that was livestock, there was a lot of money to be made in this land and on the rents. So they had a ton of money and they could throw that money into different political institutions and in sort of back candidates who would vote the way that they wanted. They also had, uh, they also had, um, they also had sort of historical importance, right? You know, you might be the third Earl of, of wherever. And that would mean that your family had held this property for a long time. So there was sort of this established um, lineage of respect being given to you. This class, though, in the 19th century is coming under threat. And they're coming under threat by the middle class and a group that we're going to call and, and, and Karl Marx, the founder, you know, the, the major political uh, socialist, would call the bourgeoisie. This is a class of people who made their money from, from the Industrial Revolution. They're people who, you know, open up factories and, and maybe turn that factory into another factory. They might be railroad magnets. They may be um, people who own shares in some sort of shipping. They're people who sort of are starting to get more money. And that's who we're turning our attention to now. This class of people are the middle class is, again, we're going to break it into sort of just for ease, two groups, upper middle and lower middle, and then upper working and lower working. The middle class, the upper middle class, would be the class that is just below the aristocracy. And they are, they are people who we might call the quote unquote nouveau riche. Now, this in many ways was considered a derogatory term, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in a future lecture. 
But the people who were nouveau rich were people who earned capital and invested it in their companies, but then could also sort of create almost an aristocratic lifestyle. These were the people who um, made their money in such a way that they could then become and, and show their wealth, right? So if you look at this picture on the bottom of the screen, this would be an image of sort of your nouveau riche, right? A, the dad wearing a very fancy suit, the children being very nicely dressed, but in their parlor or their home, right? They have you know very ornate furniture. Now they may not be royalty, they may not be aristocracy, but they are people who can almost afford that lifestyle. And they are challenging the old aristocratic people because they are now uh, wealthy and they are now people who can, who can buck the system. This also led to a growth in something called middle-class values. Middle-class values were an idea of refinement. Uh, you didn't speak harshly or brashly. You didn't... Um, show sort of where you may have come from, your working class roots. You worked on sort of refining and dressing and appearing to be that aristocratic person. You were not aristocratic, but you but you could sort of be sort of show yourself to be aristocratic. Uh, and that was really an important status to hold. The lower middle class were not necessarily the owners of the factories or the owners of the, the industries. These would be your clerks. These would be the folks who worked for the company. They may have a desk job. And that's the important thing to notice. One of the things that defined being in the middle class was not working with your hands. You had desk work to do. You wrote letters. You wrote speeches. You dealt with the numbers. You did some basic arithmetic. You did not fix things with your hands. But they worked in connection to the Industrial Revolution, right? You might be a lawyer for a factory. You might be a factory doctor. You might be a teacher working sort of adjacent to a factory, educating the children of the factory workers. You might be a clerk or a manager, but you were not in the factory per se, on the factory floor. You worked sort of around the periphery. And again, the upper middle class would be the owners of it, the people who had stake in the, the, the equity of the company. Uh, but the people who worked for the factory would be um, you know, would be in this sort of middle class, this lower middle class uh, position. Underneath the lower class, the, the lower middle class, you had the working class. Now the working class, um, I'm stratifying, breaking into two other groups again. So you have the, let's call it the upper working class and then the lower working class. The upper working class would be your skilled artisans. These would be people, again, they would they could be very wealthy and they could be people sort of knocking on the door of the people above them. But through very strict class structures, they could never become the, the upper class, the, the class above them. So these lower class working class artisans, you know, they could be coach makers, people who make the, the, the carriages for a train, a highly skilled position, one that used a lot of apprenticeships and attempting to, to, to sort of weasel your way into upper management. But they, and they may make a lot of money. Uh, one of the readings said that they may make five pounds a week, up to 250 pounds a year, right? Uh, five times uh, to five dollars, five pounds times 50, right? They may make a lot of money. You know, that's double than what a, a well paid clerk might make. But because they worked with their hands, they could never be considered middle class. 
Now, their money, though, could certainly buy them a lifestyle well above that of a lower middle class individual. So their position made them such that their capital was was very strong and they, and they may own a lot of different uh, positions, uh, factories or, or whatever it might be, shops. But again, they could because of their position, they could not be become a um, middle class person. Now, this also gave them social mobility, right? Now that they could do this, now that they were this lower class individual with a lot of capital, they could then own a, own a couple of shops. And then now once they are sort of removed from working with their hands, they could then become um, a middle class person. But there had to be that jump. The people who are the most at risk in all of this are your working class that are unskilled. These are people who work on the factory floors. They may be your people who are um, standing next to the, you know, the rollers in a tanning factory, or they might be the people sort of tending uh, to the looms in a, in a weaving factory doesn't take a great amount of skill to stand next to the machine and, and just make sure that the, the machinery is continuing to operate. So because of that, they are the most vulnerable population. They can lose their job in an instant and they would be out of luck, uh, you know, for, for a very long time uh, because they have to try and find a new role. It is the, it is this group of people who are really on the margins and, um, and are really um, obviously most at risk when depressions happen. And they have the least prospects really for social mobility. They, their, their wages hardly pay for rent in life and, and a meager food, uh, let alone better education and opportunities to open a factory of some sort. This is particularly true in the late 1830s when there's a series of poor laws, particularly the poor law amendments in 1837, that wind up hurting the, the, this group of people the most. Uh, in particular, one of the things that happens is those people who are dis disabled or become unemployed should not be receiving the, the dole outs from the government such that they are in as good a position as those who work. So they are in continuously hurt. Uh, this also establishes workhouses where you would work uh, for a daily wage and basically pay for your housing. Uh, you might be a seamstress there where you had to, you know, you would get paid uh, for stitching a shirt, but you would only get paid by the piece, right? So, you you know, if you, sh if you did two shirts a day, you would get paid for those two shirts. Uh, and it was all done by hand. So it was a very difficult situation in which these people had to live. Prostitution uh, is the, sort of the perennial position for particularly women, obviously, um, in the poorer classes. It's a way for women to, to get money. Uh, they could charge higher, higher fees, I suppose. And this would give them an ability to raise capital to turn themselves into a more established business. Uh, it certainly hurt their reputations, but it was a way to leverage their abilities and their, you know, their unskilled skills work into higher labor uh, and, and, and higher status. The last thing that really needs to be talked about in, in terms of the poor laws and another set of, of changes that happened to Britain is what's called the People's Charter. Chartism is a piece of um, British history that emerges in the 1800s as a major petition hundreds of thousands of people of the lower of the working class and the lower classes and even the lower middle classes sign on to this british people's charter and again we call the movement chartism this is a set of demands established that is petitioned to the government to try and make things within Britain better for all groups of people. Again, we're talking about things that are happening at the very beginning of Queen Victoria's reign. And this is a big wig movement, wig, W-H-I-G. And, and, and the wigs fear this. They want universal male suffrage, secret ballots, equal electoral districts, right? So equal 
uh, representation. The thing that's interesting here is they want to abolish property qualifications for the people who serve.